Awesome. Uh, so let's start the seminar now. Uh, today, uh, we are lucky to have with us Dr. Shuran Song, an assistant professor in the Department of Cogn uh, Computer Science at Columbia University. Uh, before being a professor there, she received her PhD in computer science at Princeton after completing a bachelor's in engineering at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Her research interests lie at the intersection of computer vision and robotics, and she has done very interesting work in a wide variety of applications, such as the perception system behind the MIT Princeton team in the Amazon Robotics Challenge, gripper design, multi-robot planning, and physical object representations. She has uh, received the RSS Best Systems Paper in 2019, the Best Manipulation Systems Paper Award from Amazon in 2018, and has been a finalist for Best Paper Awards at conferences such as ICRA, CVPR, and IROS. If you want to ask questions during the talk, feel free to just unmute yourselves. Uh, welcome, Sharon, to the seminar. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for the introduction. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll probably just get started. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about a few of very recent work uh, on, uh, from our group that doing uh, deformable object um, perception and manipulation. Um, and uh, so in, in my talk, actually, I have a lot of videos. Uh, and just in case some of you guys cannot really like see the video playing. So here is a link that uh, you can uh, go there and download uh, the video that actually contains all the videos that I will show in my talk. Okay, so yeah, so deformable object uh, is very important part of our life, right? So it's, uh, you can basically find them everywhere uh, in our everyday life. So every morning, the first few things that you might be doing is to probably like make your bed, uh, wipe your face with a towel or put on your shirt. And finally, uh, wear your favorite mask before you get out of your door. So during this process, uh, you can effortlessly manipulate all this uh, deformable cloth and even before you fully wake up or have your morning coffee, right? So, however, uh, the task of accurately manipulating deformable objects is still an open challenge for many of today's robotics uh, systems, which are often designed to handle rigid objects with very rigid movements. So a natural question that uh, we want to ask is what makes deformable object different? And what make, uh, like, so basically what prevents us from using those algorithms that developed for rigid objects on those deformable objects? And here are a few uh, main reasons uh, why. So first uh, is that deformable clouds are often uh, highly underactuated. So what that means is that when the robot is holding a piece of class, all it can control is a small region around the class, around its gripper. And the rest of the class will be just hanging there and the system do not have any direct control over those out of contact positions. And the second uh, is that the system will need to deal with extremely high degree of freedoms uh, when they need to kind of handle deformable objects. So in contrast to, uh, for example, rigid objects whose post or configuration can be fully specified with a few numbers, a piece of garment or cloth can easily have near infinite degree of, of freedoms. So how to efficiently represent and uh, able to infer their full configuration is another big challenge. And the third, uh, uh, this property is more specific to class, which is a subcategory of all the deformable objects, uh, which is about their geometries. So for objects like class or garments, they often consist of very thin 3D geometries that are not watertight. So this kind of unique um, geometric property makes them ill-suited for many typical 3D shape representations that are designed for solid objects, such as occupancy grade or sign distance functions. Therefore, it requires us to think about new shape representations for this type of objects. And finally, uh, because all these uh, deformable clouds are so thin and they can deform in so many different ways, they can often experience the most extreme case of self-occlusion. So for example, the ratio uh, between the observed surface and the full surface of a class can be as little as 10% uh, in many real world applications. So that will also make the perception and the planning task extremely difficult. So because all these challenges, um, prior work on garment or class uh, manipulation or perception often built on top, uh, on top of several simplifying assumptions. So for example, um, some of the work will assume high visibility of the class by only considering the class uh, when it's already wired by a human 
or rely on very strong prior knowledge about objects, such as very accurate uh, in, um, instance level mesh or full state information in the initial observation, where the perception task basically reduced into an instance level tracking problem. So uh, in today's talk, uh, what I want to do is to relax uh, those assumptions a little bit and then try to answer the question, uh, how we can effectively perceive and interact with a piece of class uh, under severe self occlusions So that's also why we have this title, uh, Unfold Unseen uh, for Deformable Class. And uh, concretely, I'm going to talk about two projects. Uh, one of them is more on the perception side, the other is more on the manipulation side. So in the first project, um, we will, uh, we will, the, the idea is to use the category level prior of garments in order to infer the unseen part of the class. And the, in the second project, we'll use uh, robot's physical action to really unfold the class and reveal the part of the class that is not directly visible. So we can uh, start with the first project, uh, where the goal is to do category level post estimation for garments. So this work uh, is done by a uh, student, Cheng Chi, who is a first year PhD student in Columbia. So the task we want to do uh, in this project is basically post estimation for garments, such as t-shirts, pants, or dresses. And the first question that we have to answer is how we should define the pose for a piece of garment. Right, so if we take a look on rigid objects, uh, the definition is very clear. So given an object instance, its pose or configuration uh, can be fully described by six degree of freedom, which is consists of a three degree of freedom of translation and another three degree of freedom of rotation. And, uh, and then we can extend this definition to a collection of objects that belongs to the same uh, category. Uh, in order to do that, we just need to define a shared category level canonical pose. So for example, for cameras uh, that's shown in this slide, we just need to uh, use the direction of the lens to align all the different object instances and then use that orientation to define the shared canonical pose for this category. Um, and then the, uh, the task of category level post estimation is then defined by uh, trying to infer the corresponding transformation between the observed object instances to this canonical pose. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, the observed object instance can sometimes be uh, like un, um, novel instances that the algorithm has not seen before during training. And we call this uh, representation NOx, uh, which stands for normalized object coordinate, uh, normalized object coordinate space, NOx. And uh, we can use a very similar idea and extend it to articulate objects by just adding a few additional degree of freedom, right? So for articulate objects, basically we can treat each of the rigid parts um, um, linked by revolute or prosthetic joints. So the pose for each part basically can be defined using the same formulation as rigid objects. But additionally, we, can, uh, we, we also need to estimate its joint parameter and the, the joint state in order to fully describe uh, articulate object. So similarly, uh, to do that, we, can, we, we will need to canonicalize all the joint states in order to provide a category level uh, post, uh, post definition for articulate objects. Okay, so now how about deformable objects like uh, t-shirt? Uh, how we can, uh, how we're going to define their poses? So are we gonna just specify the position for every single vertex on the t-shirt? Um, well, the short and simple answer is actually yes, uh, since that the government has such, or like class has such high degree of freedom, in order to fully specify its configuration or pose, we kind of need to specify every point location on the t-shirt surface. And even more, we also need to specify the position for both unobserved, uh, observed and unobserved surfaces on the t-shirt. Since we no longer have the rigid body constraints, therefore we cannot directly solve the pose for the unobserved points using algorithms like RANSAC based on the observed points. So obviously this is a lot to infer and in some sense is too much for the network to infer. However, since all the degree of freedom on a deformable class is not completely independent, therefore there is a, a strong constraint or prior that the algorithm can leverage to simplify the problem. 
So the key question here is how we, um, the key question that we kind of need to answer for this project is how we could impose those constraints or prior knowledge so that we can simplify this kind of uh, post estimation problem for a uh, deformable object. Again, uh, we can use the idea of uh, NOx by defining a, a canonical, uh, a category level canonical space for different government instances that belongs to the same category. So this canonical space uh, is defined across different uh, government instances under a similar configuration. Um, here, the configuration is defined by the government's uh, 3D geometry uh, when it's worn by a human uh, in a T-pose. So as a result, uh, this shared uh, uh, canonical space allows the algorithms to learn a strong prior within each government category that are independent from their configuration. So one way to actually try to understand this canonical space is that uh, given a uh, coordinate uh, in this canonical space, uh, it will map to a similar surface location on different government instances, which means that they are very likely to share similar local geometry or semantic meanings. So for example, all the 3D points on the shoulder um, in this example that actually map to the same um, locations in the, or a similar locations in the canonical space. And, the, and the, in the later slides, you will frequently see uh, visualizations like this, where the color, the RGB color on the mesh is actually corresponding to the X, Y, Z coordinate labels in the canonical space. So in total, uh, in this project, we consider six different government categories that is provided by the class 3D data set. So with this kind of post uh, definition, now we can finally define the task. So, uh, for, so basically the task is that given a partial observation of an unseen garment, the goal is, uh, is for the algorithm to map all the observed points uh, into a canonical level, um, into a category level canonical space. But what about those unobserved surface? Remember, since that we no longer have the rigid body constraints, we can no longer directly solve uh, those positions of unobserved points using algorithms like RANSAC. So instead, what we will do is to ask the network to complete the government's full 3D geometry in the canonical space, and therefore provide a pose for those unobserved surface as well. And finally, we'll need to map uh, back the complete shape back to the observation space so that we can, um, so that the output uh, representation is directly corresponding to the input observation. So to summarize the key idea for this project is to formulate the deformable uh, object post estimation task as a shape completion task in the canonical space. So by mapping the observed points into a canonical space, we are able to estimate the poles for all the observed points. And then by completing um, the shapes in the canonical space, we are able to estimate the poses for all the, all, uh, all the unobserved surfaces. And since the completion is happened in the canonical space, the algorithm can leverage a much stronger shape prior that is invariant to object configuration. And then in the next uh, few slides, I'm going to get into details of how we're going to do each of the steps. But is there any questions for the problem formulation? OK, so we can get into the details about the algorithm, how we actually do it. So the first uh, question is how we can get the input observation. All right, so. Okay, so here we are less interested about the task of embodied uh, class perception, where the class is being worn by a person, since the task is pretty much reduced to a human post estimation problem. Uh, but instead, we are more interested in the government under arbitrary configuration. Uh, however, the, the challenge is that if we do not pose any constraints on the government's configuration, the task can be quickly become way too hard and in some cases impossible to solve. So instead, what we do is that we use a very simple robot action to transform the class in an arbitrary configuration into a configuration that is more trackable for perception algorithm. 
So here, what we do is to ask the robot to randomly pick up uh, the class uh, from any locations that it can. And then by using this kind of simple actions, a uh, pickup action, the system is able to reveal more surface area on the garment by using the gravity force. And uh, also at the same time, um, this, can, uh, this, this action of picking up the garment is actually very simple by itself and doesn't rely on any prior knowledge about the cloth uh, or its pose which means that the robot can basically execute this action with almost 100% uh, success rate. So it won't actually uh, impact the, the following perception steps. And then after the robot pick up the, uh, the class, we will actually take a RGBD image, uh, a sequence of RGBD image of the class under the gripper, and then use that uh, point cards as an input to the algorithm. And after we get the visual observation, the next step is to label all the visible surface uh, with their canonical coordinates. So we actually uh, just simply formulate this task as a point-wise labeling task by using a standard point net plus plus network, where the output is basically the canonical um, coordinate label x y z uh, corresponding to each of the input point uh, each of the input points. Um, a small thing that we found very critical for training this network is actually uh, the, the laws that we use. So during when we are training this network, we found that actually using classification laws is much more effective than using regression, uh, uh, regression laws, uh, since it allows the network to model the bimodal distribution caused by the, the garment's symmetry. Um, so you can see that uh, if we use uh, L2 regression laws, they actually uh, encourage the network to predict the mean in between two hypotheses. And the later we'll see that it is actually okay for the network to predict the incorrect uh, coordinate label that is in the mirror, uh, that is actually mirrored from the ground truth label. Um, so basically, if, you, if the network predicts the left sleeve as a red sleeve, it's still okay. But uh, the L2 laws will make them predict something in the middle, which is really bad. I initially understood that the canonical space was continuous. Are you somehow discretizing it before doing a classification or what exactly? Yes. Uh, uh, so yeah, so in order to do uh, formulate as a classification problem, we uh, quantize uh, the canonical space. So you can imagine we uh, divide X, Y, Z uh, dimension into uh, 16 form bins, and then we just do the classification on, on each of the dimension. Okay, awesome. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, so here is just some quick result for the stage one uh, um, pipeline. So we can see that the algorithm is able to infer different garment styles, uh, like including both short and long sleeve uh, t-shirts. And uh, they're also able to like kind of infer the, the kind of uh, opening or close uh, 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 styles for this t-shirt. And uh, here is another uh, a prediction for the another category. Uh, for, I think this is, uh, skirt and, uh, and the dress. So since we know the gripper location in the, observa uh, in the observed point cloud, we, can, we are also able to infer the corresponding grass point location in the canonical space. So here the inferred grass point is labeled as a, a red dot in the canonical space. And um, uh, in the second example, actually, we can see that the algorithm made a mistake by predicting a mirrored uh, gripping point location. And later we'll see that how the algorithm is able to self-correct this kind of error. Okay, so now we mapped all the observed points uh, into the canonical space. The next step is to complete the shape in the canonical uh, space in order to provide labels for the unobserved surface. So the shape completion task for rigid objects is a very well studied problem with many prior works. So here we use a network structure very similar to GRNet uh, that first uh, scattered uh, the sparse point, uh, point net features into a 3D volume. Then we use a 3D CNN to convert the sparse uh, feature into a dense feature volume. And then finally use the implicit function to produce a high detailed uh, resolution surfaces. So there are many, uh, many uh, successful stories uh, of using such a framework for rigid object shape completion. However, uh, in, in our case, uh, the non-watertight thin structure of garments actually makes it a little bit tricky to selecting the right 3D shape representation, um, especially in the last step. So 
Uh, it is quite obvious that for many typical 3D shape representation, such as occupancy grids, are not very suitable for representing scene structures accurately, since the accuracy is actually directly limited by the voxel resolution. Uh, and uh, if we want to increase the resolution, uh, it will result in very sparse uh, uh, data distribution or very high memory consumptions. Uh, and however, for other uh, shape representations like sine distance function, uh, they are able to represent a very accurate surface uh, by um, assigning different signs for, uh, for, for, for the volumes that are inside and outside the garment, where the zero crossing surface precisely describes the location of the surface. Uh, however, this uh, TSDF representation can only describe watertight surface with no holes. And if we directly extract uh, the zero crossing surface, we'll get additional surfaces around the garment openings like the, net, uh, the neck and the waist. So to address this issue, we actually use a new shape representation called a generalized vending number field that allows us to represent thin surface uh, with openings. So first, uh, what is the vending number field? Right, so what uh, vending number is uh, computed by, a, so vending number at a given point is defined by the signed length of the projection of the curve onto a unit circle. And the value will be normalized by two pi. Therefore, it's a value range from uh, negative one to one. And intuitively, for a point that's inside a closed surface, the vending number is equal to one. And for a point that's outside the curve, uh, a closed curve, the, uh, the projection kind of cancel, cancels its, uh, itself. Therefore, the vending number is zero. Uh, and then if we compute the vending number for all the location in the space, we'll get a vending number field. And that's the definition for 2D. And we can easily extend this definition um, into 3D by replacing the 2D angle with the solid angle in 3D. Um, so, uh, and, but why, why we use this random number field, right? What special property make it actually desirable for our application? Um, so um, actually, if we only consider the cases where the surface is a watertight, then the value, it will be constants one uh, inside the surface and zero outside. So it's basically the same as occupancy grid, which is not very exciting. However, uh, when the surface has openings, uh, the things become more interesting. So for those surfaces, we can uh, kind of observe a very smooth transition from inside positive value to outside negative value on the openings. Um, in fact, this function is harmonic and smooth everywhere except discontinuities on the surface. Um, therefore, by detecting the gradients on the running number field, we can find both surface and opening. And then by use the gradient magnitude, we can distinguish the surface and openings. And here are just um, uh, intuitive examples of uh, running number fields and its corresponding gradient magnitude. So you can see that the magnitude, uh, the gradient magnitude on the surface openings uh, is much smaller than the, the gradients on the, on the surface itself. So, by using that, we, can, we are able to de uh, detect which part is surface, which part is opening. So yeah, as a result, we can represent thin surface with openings. And here are some example results for the shape completion results uh, step. So on the left uh, is the input canonical um, uh, coronary prediction of uh, the input NOx for this step and the ground truth surface. And then on the right, you can see the shape completion results by using different shape representations. And here is another result for a pen. So you can see that a vending number field is able to uh, represent the thin surface, uh, but also represent openings. Okay, so as the last step, uh, we need to map the completed uh, 3D mesh from its canonical space back to the observation space. Um, which is the coordinate frame of the original input point cloud, so that we can actually uh, finally establish the, the correspondence between the input point cloud uh, to its full uh, configuration. So eventually the output uh, representation actually describes the full configuration of the garment in the task space, including both observed and unobserved surface. Okay, so for this step, actually we have two possible approach. So one approach is just simply apply a physical, uh, a physics simulator to simulate the pose of the, uh, the completed mesh uh, with the predicted grass point. 
And the other approach is actually to just use machine learning to directly learn the mapping from the canonical space back to ta uh, the observation space. And um, basically learning the inverse operation as a first step uh, for the full 3D surface. So we'll take a look on both uh, approach. So uh, for the first approach, uh, what we will do is we will use the predicted grasping points from the first step and the completed 3D uh, mesh in the second step. And then we'll simulate how the clouds will fall under the gravity force. Um, yeah, so this is like the simulation process. And by simulating this uh, physics process, we can map the predicted 3D mesh back to the original observation space. So the advantage for this approach is that it can always predict the result that actually looks physically possible. However, the disadvantage for this approach is that it's actually very sensitive to errors in the earlier step. Uh, so for example, if you predict incorrect grasping points or predict a mesh that's uh, kind of wrong, then they cannot really correct any of those errors and uh, those errors will propagate to the final result. And then the second approach is to directly predict uh, the warp field as another implicit function. So basically what they do is to take in a sample point P that is on the uh, uh, 3D surface as an input and then output the, the warping vector for that position. So, um, and, and this output is basically the, uh, the, the point location in the original input observation space. So the feature that we use for this, uh, for this network uh, includes two parts. One is the original point uh, position in the observation space uh, for the uh, observed points. So if it is a surface point that is not originally observed, then this part, uh, they doesn't really have this part. And the second part is the point and plus plus features that is produced uh, for the first stage. So, okay, so, and then the output is again, the, uh, the, the, the warping field for each of the surface, uh, for the, each of the surface, a uh, 3D surface point. And so, so the advantage for this uh, approach is that by directly learning this kind of warping, the algorithm actually is more robust against the prediction errors happened in the early stage. So actually later you'll see that it's able to correct some of the, those errors happened in the second and answer stage. However, the issues with this approach is that, is that sometimes it actually can produce um, like just uh, not physically possible results, uh, such as self-intersections. Uh, um, but I think qualitatively or like quantitatively, uh, the learning-based method actually always produces more accurate uh, predictions. So here are some uh, results for the, for the last uh, step. So, um, yeah, so you can see that uh, in this result, actually the, in the first step, the grasping point is predicted in the mirrored position. So it's supposed to be on the right sleeve, but it's actually predicted on the right sleeve. So uh, in this case, the physics simulation-based approach will infer a wrong pose based on the mirrored grasping point prediction. However, the warp field for prediction uh, is able to self-correct this error and predict a more correct pose. Yeah, that is the warp field prediction. And then here is another example for pens. Uh, again, the learned warp field is able to self-correct uh, the incorrect, uh, the mirrored predictions in the in the first step. Okay, so now we can put everything together to uh, form the end-to-end -end framework of GarmaNet, which consists of major three steps. So first, it's mapped input point clouds into a canonical space. And the second uh, is to complete the 3D shape in the canonical space. And the last step is to warp the completed shape back to the input space. And then the final output representation will describe the Garmin uh, full, con uh, full configuration using complete 3D mesh, uh, where each of the vertex is labeled with their canonical space label. And here I'm just going to show you some of the results uh, from the network uh, for, from different government categories. So on the top row is the prediction, bottom row is ground truth. And we also show the results from different stages. So the shape completion result and also the final result that's in the task space. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this is actually a typical, um, showing a typical failure case, which is the, the, the system still have trouble handling like really thin uh, like structures like the, the, uh, the stress on the shoulder. Okay, so to summarize uh, the key idea for uh, GarmentNet uh, is uh, the problem formulation itself, uh, which we basically formulate the category level post estimation problem for garments uh, as a shape completion task in their canonical space. And um, by leveraging the category level prior, uh, the algorithm is able to infer the full configuration of an unseen garment, including both observed and unobserved surfaces. Uh, and in addition, we also propose to use vending number fields as a new shape representation in deep learning, which is suitable for representing class or garments that consist of very thin surfaces with openings. So any questions about this project so far? Hi, uh, can I ask a small question? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it seems that many things that you're trying to learn here is actually not a function because there are many configurations of the canonical coordinates that can map to the same uh, deformed observation. So I was wondering, um, do you think there's enough information from like the uh, observed ones to actually reconstruct what's not a function? And like, did you have any trouble during the learning process of uh, learning something that is not a function? Like you have flip solutions that combine, degenerate into like a bad solution or something like this? Um. So I, I, my understanding of your question is, uh, is there, um, when we are learning this kind of mapping from, for example, observation to the canonical space, um, is there enough information for the network actually to learn this kind of mapping? Right, right. It doesn't seem like a, a function, like a one-to-one -one function, yeah. Yeah, it, it is a one-to-one -one function. It's, it's actually mapping from a surface to another surface, but it's just in different configuration. And uh, indeed, it's also a very challenging task. Um, so I think that the, the hypothesis for like the whole idea of uh, NOx or canonical uh, space representation is that what, what's the network trying to learn is try to pick up the local geometries or lo uh, local informations and then try to see what, which, um, how to map those local geometry features into a canonical space. So for example, for garments, like, uh, Maybe if you find a random patch on the, uh, on the garment, it's very hard to map to the canonical space. But there is uh, local information like sleeves and like shoulders. They are actually very distinguished, uh, um, have very distinguished features that actually can inform this kind of mapping. And um, uh, this can, uh, so, so the whole idea of Knox is to learn this mapping and then can leverage both local and global information. And, and of course, I think sometimes they, the network actually cannot predict very accurate uh, the NOx mapping or like they can they actually predict either flipped or just completely wrong NOx mapping. But uh, the shape completion step actually helps to correct some of those errors. Um, because in the con uh, canonical space, uh, actually there is much less variance between different garments and the shape completion actually can leverage much stronger shape prior. Thank you. Um, nice. Yeah, so is there um, any results or like, so So I guess, is there some limitation where if the input, uh, if the input RGBD image is noisy, will that cause some parts of this to break down or is it robust in that case? It only will cause some problems. So uh, we, we for, for example, when we test on the real, uh, real world printout, uh, so most of the, the result you see today is actually from synthetic uh, rendered uh, depth image, which is very clean and nice. And uh, the algorithm can perform really well. And we do observe that the algorithm performance um, drops uh, when you have uh, much noisy point clouds. And I think that's like, it, uh, the underlying problem is very common for like sim to real transfers. And uh, we are like still thinking about what, is there other ways that we can, for example, train the system uh, less rely on synthetic data, but can directly train on real to solve those problems. Um, is, um, is, so would you say, okay, so I guess you said one problem is that it's hard to do sim to real in general, but is, is another problem just this idea that we're trying to do like a dense reconstruction of like all these points at once, for example, 
I don't know if you if you did key points or I mean it's not it's it's there's reasons why we can't do that here, but is the fact that we're doing like a dense reconstruction the problem? Yeah, so actually the this this Knox representation or dense representation is very similar to key points, but just remove the requirements that we need to define key points. So um, the network actually learns that which which points is like easier to learn, which points is harder to learn. And uh, for the harder to point, learn points, uh, how we can rely on the neighboring points to infer my, my location. So I think that's, um, uh, if you look at the results, you can see that there are certain points that the network predicts with higher confidence. There are certain points that the, the network predicts with lower confidence. And actually the shape completion step taking, uh, taking into account for all those inference and then kind of choose which points to, to rely on in order to uh, based on the shape completion results. So I think key point is another like very interesting uh, representation that doesn't require this kind of dense, um, uh, dense mapping or uh, 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 dense point to point mapping. Um, maybe it's easier to train in real world, uh, but we just uh, didn't try it here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Patrick John Chia asks, uh, after the RGB data is collected, how are the labels for canonical representations obtained? Yeah, so I think the, because most of our training is in simulation, so what we do is that we just simulate how the cost is being grasped it. And then we have the, 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 the full ground truth in simulation by simulating that, by rendering the, the UV maps or the coordinate maps um, in, in simulation. Okay, so maybe I will move on to, to the, the, the next project. Okay, so in the first project, we mostly just focus on perception. And the only step that actually involves robots is uh, step zero, where we ask the robot to pick up the class. However, this very simple action actually is very critical for the task completion because it significantly reduces the difficulty for the perception task. And that got us thinking, uh, what if the robot is just able to kind of use its own action to physically unfold the t-shirt? Uh, will that make perception algorithm so much easier, right? So in the next project, uh, we'll push a little bit more on the interaction side or the manipulation side uh, by trying to see how we can use a, a robot's physical action to actually unfold and reveal the unseen part of the cloud. And this work is done by Hui, uh, which is an undergrad student uh, in Colombia. So let's first talk about the task of class unfolding, whereas our objective is to maximize the visible uh, area, surface area of a cloud. So this task is actually very help, uh, useful uh, since it is almost like always a common first step for um, any class manipulation pipeline. Because by unfold a class, we are able to reveal many key features on the class that is initially maybe hidden uh, in the first uh, in the initial observation. So therefore, uh, in this state, uh, it can actually simplify a lot of later planning step. However, although the objective of unfolding a class uh, is simple, learning a policy that can efficiently unfold the arbitrary class is quite challenging. So here is a video of two arm robots, uh, or two robot arm, uh, that are trained to unfold a t-shirt using pick and place. So you can see that it actually takes the system a very long time uh, and many steps to actually make some progress. And actually, uh, if uh, the, the class corner is not uh, like initially observable, this, um, the system will actually cannot make much progress even with many steps. And also sim um, similarly, if the class is too large and it's larger than the robot's physical reach range, uh, then the class will actually never be fully unfold just because of the robot's physical uh, limitation. And actually this system reflects a common limitations for many powers in class unfolding, where the robots use uh, only quasi static interactions like pick and place. Um, so over the years, uh, there are so many sophisticated algorithms and methods are proposed to model deformable objects. However, uh, the final system are oftentimes uh, still highly inefficient. So they can easily take hundreds of steps just to unfold a very small piece of class. And here is actually an example of a such system that actually takes, I think, more than 100 steps to unfold this uh, small class. So 
As a result, uh, many of the works in class manipulation actually considers a much simpler case, where the class is almost unfold, uh, and the key features of the class is already visible in the initial state. But let's take a step back and think about how would you unfold a large class like a blanket? Will you carefully pick and place every single corner of the class? Probably not, right? So what you'll probably do is probably something similar to this. So you will grasp the blanket with two hands, stretch it, and then fling it over the bed with high velocity to fully unfold it. So this example actually shows that what's really missing in our robot system is actually the capability of using high velocity dynamic manipulations which is something that we human actually constantly using in our everyday life in order to improve our physical reachability and action efficiency. And concretely, there are three main advantages of using dynamic actions in comparison to quasi-static uh, pick and place actions. So first is that uh, they are efficient. Um, in the earlier example, we can see that uh, a, task, a single fling action can actually be more effective than many more um, quasi-static pick and place actions. And second is dynamic manipulation also helps in expanding the system's effective reach range. So let's we, we uh, kind of said in earlier, since most of the class are um, underactuated, the robot does not have a direct control over the position that's far away from the gripper. However, with high velocity actions, we actually give the system an opportunity to manipulate the part of the objects that is out of contact or even out of the robot reach range. And finally, uh, dynamic action also uh, generalizes a while since they no longer uh, rely on process uh, uh, precisely identifying those specific key points on the class. And later we'll show that uh, a policy that trains on only squared class actually generalizes well uh, to more complex class like uh, uh, t-shirts. So using this idea, we designed our system called Flingbot. Uh, it's basically uh, it's, uh, a fully self-supervised system that's able to uh, achieve over 80% uh, coverage for class unfolding within uh, three interaction steps. So in our experiment, we use two UR5 arms that has, uh, and also two RGBD cameras. So uh, for this two RGBD camera, one of them is actually taking a front view of the workspace, uh, especially uh, mostly for after the robot lift up the class. And the second camera take a top down image uh, that is used for predicting grasping lo uh, location and positions. So what the algorithm need to do uh, is to take a, uh, all the image as input and then output uh, the parameters for the uh, fling primitive, which we'll talk uh, in a bit. So after each of the action, uh, the top-down camera will capture an image of the class um, before and after the interaction and then compute the delta coverage of the class and then use that as a supervision signal to supervise the network training. So, uh, and in the end of each of the episodes, the system will also automatically recite uh, its state by just uh, randomly pick up the class and drop it back to the workspace. So the whole, uh, as a result, the whole system is able to learn uh, with mostly uh, supervision uh, with, with minimal human intervention. Okay, now we're gonna talk about how we designed the, or uh, structured the two arm fling primitive, which consists of a few uh, different steps. So first, the arm need to pick up, uh, find two grasping points to pick them up. And second, uh, the system need to stretch the class. Third, uh, they will need to use a high velocity swing action to fling the class forward and then finally place them down into the workspace. So for each step in this sequence, they actually has parameters that controls each of the steps. So in another word, uh, in order to perform this primitive, we'll need to choose where to pick, um, how far to stretch, how fast to fling, and finally where to place. However, for the task of class unfolding, there are a few uh, natural answers for those questions. So for example, for step two, we just need to stretch as far as possible uh, without tearing the class. And for the last step, we just need to uh, place it in a reasonable place that is still in the workspace. So now what the system needs to learn is basically where to pick and how fast to fling. 
And uh, so let's first fix the fling speed and then focus on the first step. So what we just do did is that by taking a complex multi-step uh, primitive reduced into a much easier problem of finding two good grasping points. However, uh, we'll see that learning these two grasping points still requires some careful thought. Uh, it is because that there are a few constraints that we need to impose on those grasping point selections. So the first constraint is that uh, we call it over cro uh, crossover constraint. Uh, which means that we don't want the left and the right arms to cross each other and therefore collide with each other. Instead, the left, uh, the left arm should always uh, stay in the left and the right arm should always stay in the right. And the second constraint is a grasp width constraint, which also very easy to understand. We don't want them, uh, the grasp uh, 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 width to be too far or too close. So, we need to output two variables, uh, left uh, picking point and right picking point. And also uh, we want to make sure that those points satisfy the constraints. So one option is that we can directly predicting those parameters. However, satisfying constraints um, kind of become really challenging because um, they are all entangled together. You can imagine that you can ask the network to predict L and, let, uh, L and R independently and then filter out and reject invalid combinations. But that's just uh, going to get really messy and complicated. Another option uh, is that we can just ask the network to predict the center point of uh, this two picking point, which we call C. And then um, additionally, we can ask the network to predict uh, the angle of uh, that's uh, uh, describing the orientation of, uh, of this line and also the grasp width, which is described by W. So this parameterization allows our system to compute the left and right uh, grasping point with very simple trigonometry that's always satisfying the constraints. So now our task is to learn the parameters of C, theta, and W. So one approach is, again, directly regressing the, the three numbers, C, theta, and W. However, we want a more uh, sample efficient method, which means that we want to use the structure of the problem to inject some uh, inductive bias into the learning process. So for class unfolding, um, there's actually a few uh, um, uh, important properties or like uh, equivalence that we want to maintain uh, with respect to the input image. So first is uh, translation, which means that if the class shift around in the workspace, the grasp points should also shift together with the input. And the second uh, is rotation. Um, it basically means that if the input class is rotated, the, gra uh, the best grasping point should also be rotated with the same angle. And also for scale, uh, well, uh, so if, although the, the, the size of the class may actually eventually influence uh, the flinging speed because they can influence the class mass, but it shouldn't really influence the selection of grasping point positions. Okay, so to do this, we uh, use the, the, uh, the idea of spatial action map with a value network that's trying to evaluate all the grasping candidates. So the key idea for spatial action map is that whenever you try to reason about the rotations and the scales in the output, you want to offload those reasonings uh, uh, into transforming your input uh, observation. So in another word, uh, rather than rotating and scaling the grass parameter, we want to rotate and scale the image input and then infer the scores for a fixed grass parameter. And so here is how we actually apply it into uh, this problem. So given an input image, we can uh, scale and uh, rotate it to obtain a collection of transformed input image. And then where the, uh, the scaling factor actually corresponding to the grasp width W and there's a rotation corresponding to different grasp angles uh, theta. And the output is a dense value map where each pixel is corresponding to one uh, possible center locations for true arm grasp which is the C. And the action selection is done by simply pick the pixel with the highest grasping value among all the scale and the rotations. And this whole uh, value network is trained uh, to predict the delta surface area with self-suppressed learning that we described earlier. So here is a simulation environment that we used uh, to do ablation study. So our uh, policy is trained on different rectangle cloth of different sizes. And uh, we also explicitly test uh, the algorithm with larger cloths that is actually larger than the system's maximum reach range. 
And the last year you also test our policy with uh, very different uh, with cloth that with, has different shapes, which is like shirts with long sleeve or short sleeves. So we can see that although the policy is only trained on rectangle cloth, it will also uh, be able to do well on search, uh, shirts with different shapes. Okay, so here I'm going to show you some of the real world experiments and comparisons. So um, here is the system in action. On the left, we compared with uh, a, a, um, a system that's only used pick and place uh, action. And below is the plot of the uh, class coverage with respect to interaction steps, which shows the efficiency of different uh, uh, manipulation policies. So you can see that the fling bar is able to reach very high coverage with very uh, small number of interaction steps. So here's another example that's uh, that is actually a, a much larger uh, rectangle cloud. Yeah, the pick and place actually didn't make a lot of progress eventually. Um, and then here is another example for t-shirts. Um, Yeah, the fling bar is down and uh, the pick and play is still going. And here just more results uh, for uh, in our real world experiment. And if you are interested, you can check out the, uh, the web page which has more uh, videos. And in case your network is not good, you can also check out the web page for more uh, videos and visualizations. Okay, so we also qual uh, quantitatively evaluate our algorithms and compare with uh, two quasi-static baselines, which are pick and place and pick and drag. So here, fling bar reaches uh, over 80% coverage within three steps, uh, while the baselines um, typically stuck around 60% of coverage. And here, we also actually include a, a variant of our approach, which actually learns the fling speed on top of the grasping strategy with reinforcement learning. However, we see that it is, uh, with this additional speed inference, it's only slightly improved the performance. Therefore, we actually prefer the simpler version um, as our final approach. So to, in, uh, to summarize in this project, uh, the key idea is to demonstrate the effectiveness of dynamic manipulation for class unfolding. And more specifically, we, uh, how they improve the system's efficiency, uh, increase their effective reach range, and also uh, able to achieve a good generalization to out of distribution cloud. So um, I think that's uh, mostly for the two projects. And earlier today, I started my talk by listing out all the unique properties about deformable clouds that makes them hard to deal with. However, I also want to end my talk by also telling the other side of the story, which is what other properties that actually make deformable objects easier to handle. And while we are talking about them, I will also recap how we actually leverage them in our approaches and discuss how we could inspire, how uh, those properties could uh, inspire future research directions. So first uh, is a strong shape prior. I kind of get uh, on a talk about this point a little bit earlier. So because the functionality of garments, they are mostly designed to cover all body, they often share very uh, similar topological structure. So for example, although the same uh, shirt may look very different under different configuration, but the different shirt actually shares very similar structure under the same configuration, which provide a very strong ca uh, category level prior that can be used for machine learning algorithms. So another way to think about it is that for rigid objects like chairs, we can easily find different versions of them has two, three, or four legs. However, it is very hard for us to find a shirt that has actually like one or three sleeves because of this, uh, because their functionality, right? So in our project, uh, we leverage this property by defining and using a canonical level, uh, a category level canonical space. And um, the next question is actually also the question that I got during the, uh, 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 the talk is that, can we uh, enable the machine learning algorithm to automatically discover a much more complex representation to represent category level garments by exploiting this kind of shape parts. So for example, maybe you only need to learn a few critical points on the garments instead of full 3D uh, surfaces. But here we don't want to manually define which uh, 3D points are more important, but instead allowing the algorithms to discover them. 
And the second, uh, oops, okay. And this, uh, the, the second point is that uh, for deformable objects, they are actually much easier to grasp. So here, it def definitely doesn't mean that they are easy to manipulate. I'm just talking about grasping. So for example, giving a rigid object, there are a very limited number of good grasp poses, and they're often very sensitive to grasp orientations and grip sizes, right? Which means that if the pose estimation algorithm is slightly off, uh, the grasp will fail. However, for de deformable objects, we can basically grasp it from any locations and any, any orientation as long as the, point, uh, the grasping point is on the object. So in our pro we kind of leverage this property in both of the projects, um, such as the, the random pickup strategy used in the first project. And also in the second project, we actually simplify uh, the two-arm grasping problem by ignoring the grasp orientation for each individual grippers. However, precisely manipulating deformable objects into a target configuration uh, is still a very challenging task and may require much closer integration between perception and planning. So for example, the system will need to estimate the government's poses in order to plan its action and also learn to use action, which action to use in order to reduce ambiguities for a perception algorithm. Uh, and I think all those are very interesting research directions or future uh, directions to, to think about or study. And the last uh, is that since deformable objects are soft and compliant, they're actually in general much safer to interact with and they will have um, much less con concern about creating collisions. So as a result, it is much easier to set up self-supervised learning framework for deformable objects. So since objects are soft, so they're in general safer uh, to let the robot to play with them by themselves. Just like how we typically give babies soft toys before we give them rigid ones. Right. And similarly, um, because they're uh, safer, so they're also kind of like uh, easier for us to apply high speed actions on deformable objects. So all these properties actually uh, are what make uh, training fling bots in real world possible. So the question here uh, is, can we take uh, this idea of self-supervised dynamic manipulation one step further and allow the robot to, to acquire those dynamic manipulation strategies automatically? So, so far, what we have done is first we have identified the manipulation primitives such as fling, and then we try to um, build up a learning algorithm to learn the parameters for those primitives. However, uh, there are a large family of dynamic manipulation strategies out there, and it will be impossible for us to engineer every single one of them, right? Can we allow the robot to discover those useful strategies and automatically select which strategy to use uh, in order to achieve its goal? And I believe it is possible and absolutely necessary for achieving efficient manipulation for deformable objects. And uh, with that, I think that's the end of my talk. And I want to uh, thank all my collaborators and funding agencies for their support to make all these projects possible. And I think we also have some time for questions. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Sharon, for the great talk. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself, or if someone else is talking, you can also uh, raise your hand or write it in the chat. I'll start with a question. It was very, uh, I really like the idea of the winding number that you mentioned in the first part of the talk. Um, if I understood uh, correctly. Sorry, I, I didn't hear your question. I, I, yeah, can, can I repeat? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, sorry. Okay, awesome. No, I, I hadn't finished it, even, so I'll restart the question. So basically I was uh, really, I really liked the idea of the winding number that you mentioned at the beginning of the of the talk, in the first part. And I, I, if I understood correctly, one of the advantages is that it's continuous in the position of the kind of 3D space instead of kind of just discrete, is it inside or outside? Uh, another advantage, if I, if I understand correctly, is that if the garment deforms slightly, this is also continuous with respect to this deformation. Uh, so uh, same position in space, you deform the garment slightly, this is also continuous. Has this type of continuity also been used to do manipulation uh, and, and reason about this uh, in continuity in time kind of? Yeah, I think that's a very, uh, very good point. I don't think so. At least uh, we haven't uh, uh, tried to leverage that in manipulation, but I think this, this property of continuous uh, continuity 
it's actually also true for like uh, uh, like sine distance based uh, uh, representations. Uh, I think it's kind of for, for, for that aspect, I think it's kind of shared across uh, several uh, possible shape representations. But I think you're, you're making a good point that like we're mostly using this kind of shape representation uh, in perception, uh, but I think it's definitely also very useful for manipulation and we should definitely explore more. Awesome. Um, any other questions? It's also a bit, uh, I guess we put some questions inside the talk, so it's also a bit past 3 p.m., but if anyone has one last question. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, so the, I guess this is kind of related to uh, Terry's question earlier, where he was asking about, oh, it's not a function or like it's like the multimodal mapping, right? And um, I guess like, I guess uh, one of the strategies you use is to quantize the space and do classification. And I guess like the labels for each sample is like um, a one hot vector, right? Mm -hmm. And you're basically doing something like, okay, it is multimodal, but because we average the scores because what the network will end up learning is we average the scores and then we take the argmax that it still works, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is so actually another thing that I didn't mention uh, um, is like, so I, I actually we use the same strategy for, for the original Knox paper is that uh, it's basically, it's called like symmetry loss. So if you, if you know that there is a symmetry uh, in, in this object, you actually can just uh, allow the network to predict either uh, either one of the, the, the correct, or you think is correct, uh, poses or coordinates. Um, so I think that is, from our experience, uh, it also helps in kind of learning this multimodal distribution, but it's not um, as critical as the, the, the classification formulation. I see. I guess, so, and then you're, okay, okay. And you're using cross entropy loss, right? Mm -hmm. Or just over, okay. Um, was there like, so like, like what, like practically speaking, like what you end up seeing is it doesn't converge to zero loss, right? It converges to some sort of high value, but after you do the argmax, you're able to get a high accuracy, like success rate is still high after doing the argmax. Yeah, so actually, um, so if you use the, the symmetry loss, they basically pick, uh, they will com compare like two hypotheses and then uh, as long as they predict one is correct, you will have like a uh, zero loss. So it's possible if you add uh, that symmetry loss, it's possible that the network actually can basically uh, uh, reach very low loss for that. Um, and what's the, what's the, the other question? Uh... Oh, I think one thing is I'm, I'm also talking about the, uh, the part where you're doing the, uh, the cloth unfolding part, not just the first part, like because like, like you also have to handle multimodality in that case, right? Uh, you mean the second project or the Yes, first? the second project, the second project. Yeah, for the second project, actually we do not model the pose of the class at all. So right. it's just image in and then action out. Uh, there is, we, we don't observe there's like significant issues with, with uh, like symmetry. Um, and for that, for that, uh, to train that value network, actually use regression. So it's the oh. network actually directly regress the, the delta coverage value. So that is not a classification task. Okay, 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 thank you. Hi, um, I have a question about uh, the first part of the talk when you're reconstructing the uh, canonical pose of various pieces of cloth by picking it up. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yeah, so, so finding that can be really challenging as you showed for like thin straps or perhaps other small but important real features. So do you think that solving this uh, problem requires being able to see it better uh, in perception by perhaps picking it up more times? Or do you think it's more, uh, or, or do you think solving it maybe should have more emphasis on reconstructing essential physical elements and the canonical representation to like hold it together? Yeah, yeah, I think both are very important. I think the, the, the first one is actually can we get a better a view of this object, right? Can we use interaction to see it better? So actually, I think for the second project, if we already have this system before we do the first project, we actually don't need to go through all these things, right? We just unfold it and we pretty much see everything. Um, so I, I think that's, that, that is important to help the, the 
the perception system to make the perception uh, system easier by using interaction. I think uh, that's a very valid point. And I think the second point is also valid. It's like, can we actually embed more power in this kind of um, canonical representation or just in general the representation? So now in the canonical representation, the, the core of that approach, they only kind of leverage the geometry power. They got, actually didn't really consider like whether it is physically possible or whether uh, like the check is, is a class still one piece. So for example, a lot of failure case uh, is sometimes the class has a gap in between and then um, like the shape completion didn't produce one piece of the class. So those things actually can be addressed if we consider stronger uh, physical powers that we can embed in those representation. Um, Thanks. Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks a lot, Sharon, for coming to the seminar. Okay, thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.